Chapter 9 I stopped on the near side of the bridge and lit a cigarette. Before me, due west, a storm was spilling over the top of the shale bluffs that formed the far perimeter of the valley. Thick blue mists trailing faint tendrils were beginning to darken the shade of the rock. A gentle, glimmering moisture was gliding down the slope toward the city. I figured the storm would be on the bridge in less than an hour. I blew out smoke and glanced around. It was the first opportunity I had to get my bearings. Here, it was still a pretty day. Here, it was damn near earth. Sloping flatlands, blue sky, a clear blue river that sparkled cheerfully past the milk-white complex dome. I shook my head in wonder. It wasn't Earth at all, but it could have been. I had been to maybe two dozen planets like this. None of them had been Earth either, but they were man places just the same. It gave me the creeps. Some thinker types claimed it was because Homo Sap was the perfect model for the universe. They cited things like bisymmetry and opposing limbs and, ever since finding ants, something called adaptation by individual to explain it. These weren't just made for man, they said. Man was made for them. Man was the model. I didn't buy it. I had drunk water and swatted flies on alien soil again and again, and they had been man places. I had felt that with a subtle certainty. I still did. Another idea used the model for the universe bit as well, but extended it to mean that there were homo saps out there who had nothing to do with Earth at all. These other guys were supposed to have sprung full-blown from another place, but be just like us. The thinkers who thought this thought something else. They thought we would run into them, and soon. A statistical certainty, they claimed, that these other saps would be along. I remember one seeing a vid on it with one guy claiming they would show up any minute, and another guy boshing it with the question of how would we know if we ran into a new bunch or not, as spread out and weird as we already were. Maybe they were already here and we didn't know it, the guy had added, and laughed. The first guy hadn't laughed at all. He had just smiled politely. But the smile and the courtesy didn't stop the twinkle in his eyes from coming across. That had given me the creeps too. Man places. I glanced back across the river towards the squalor of the city. Whoever these new folks were, I sure hoped they were neater. We're quite a bunch, I believe but it's obscene what we do to our worlds. It took me half an hour to reach the edge of the mess. The city's eastern boundary was marked by a second bridge that crossed what had once been a gently babbling brook. It was mostly sewer now. I stopped at the far end of the bridge, hesitant to go any farther. The rain was really coming down now. Clouds of it whipped up and down the narrow passageways between the junk pile homes, rusting everything that wasn't treated, driving everyone indoors and, of course, making more mud. I noted a couple of boot prints that looked knee-deep and shuddered. I didn't want to go in there. It wasn't just the mud. It wasn't just that this was another refugee camp, for I'd seen those plenty of times. It was... Even without the driving rain, the city was dark. Dark and dreary and hopeless and clogged with despair. It was the ant war, maybe, and the fleet projects nearing downward at them. There was a texture of paranoia, a tragic uneasiness, guilt. It wasn't a happy place. I took a deep breath and stepped calf-deep into the mud. It got a little better as I worked my way up from the creek bank towards the central square, head bowed against the rain and my boots splashing against the minor torrents of runoff rain. Borglin had said I would know which passage to take by a huge steeple constructed at the entrance to one of the paths. There was no sign of anything even faintly religious from where I stood, but that could simply have been the weather. It was now dark enough for sundown. I shrugged and picked the widest lane. 
It shrunk so fast it made your heart ache, ending abruptly against a sheer wall of curved and warped plasteel three stories high. I backed out and turned around eagerly. The next lane was worse. It narrowed at the first bend and then narrowed again at the second. There were two more sharp twists within the next few meters, making the passage tunnel-like beneath jutting skags of warped bulkhead plates. I paused in the darkness to wipe the rain from my eyes. From the shadows to my right came a long, wheezing moan. I, blinded, took a soggy, slippery step toward the sound. I heard the moan again and saw, tucked uneasily into what had once been an emergency recess panel, an old man. He was wrapped up poorly against the rain and growing cold with the sort of rags that this place would have created. There was a faint click and a further movement of shadow that formed a little boy or a little girl wearing the same sort of rags and a determined look. A knife gleamed dully in a tiny but steady hand. You want something, mister? Asked a voice belonging to a trapped animal, which was just what he, she was. No, I replied, stepping back with my hands held out where they could be seen. I backed away a few more steps, then stopped. I'm looking for the steeple, I called into the shadows. You know where that is? There was no reply. I repeated my question and waited. Then I moved back up the path, again holding my hands where they could be seen. The recess was empty. No ragged old man, no desperate child. Both had disappeared into the maze of the place. I knew better than to pursue that determined kid. I backed out around the corners and started up the next path. A few steps up, there was a piercing flash of lightning out of the east, followed by a truly awful peal of thunder. Between shaking from one and jumping at the other, I caught sight of what had once been the steeple. It lay over on one side, blocking the passageway. It was black with soot from a recent fire. I stepped through the charred latticework of its universal elongated pyramid design. The spot where I braced myself was already worn smooth from the passage of many other muddy fingertips. The going got a little easier after that. Easier to see, anyway, for people were starting to turn their lights on inside their little cubicles or apartments or monk cells or Whatever you should call the junk around a refugee village. Apartments seem best if you can imagine a giant, like, say, Thor ripping spacecraft apart, just tearing cabins loose one by one, like a child separating the petals on a flower, and then stacking what was left to make three-story nightmares. I couldn't imagine what made them huddle on top of one another like that. Sure, some of the Buildings were made up of whole bulkhead seals on end, and they usually came in threes. But most of the junk had just been wedged up there on purpose, as if they were shoved together by the timid members of some herd, ready to accept anything, even smothering, to avoid the outer edges of the campfire, where wolves could prowl and chase. It wouldn't matter to those folk that the wolves were inside with them. A new planet carries a primordial chill. Anyway, mid-afternoon or not, the lights were beginning to come on. The rain had shrunk to little more than a sprinkling trickle. The thunder continued, but it was a distant rumble now, accompanied by distant swellings of orange light rising unevenly from the edges of that craggy, twisted skyline. Borglin had told me that once I had found the steeple, I would be home free. He had said to stay on the main path with the steeple all the way to the end and I would be there. It was a lot easier trip the way he had told it. I was beginning to get an idea as to the size of this place. Within the next hundred meters or so, I must have passed a dozen side paths, many of which were just as impressive as the one I was following. I trusted to direction for the most part, though even with this policy I ran the risk of getting lost. Everything twisted here. Every path, every alley, every bulkhead... I didn't even bother to try to ignore what that could have meant omen-wise, the way things were looking so far. I was already screwed anyway. It beats prison, I caught myself saying once out loud, 
and wondered how often that had happened without my having noticed it before. Just about then, it all got a little tighter. I saw the bouncing, bobbing glow of their lamps first, coming around a corner of one of the side paths. Instinctively, I crouched back into a recess as they appeared. There were five of them, all men it seemed in that light, stumbling hurriedly into the passage just ahead of me. Three of them carried lamps. Two of them carried... dragged someone between them. All had a knife or a club or some sort of weapon. They increased their pace when they got onto the passageway I had been following, looking back over their collective shoulders for pursuit. I held still where I was to give them a chance to put a little distance between us. I was now no longer sure whether or not I wanted to continue. Well, let's say I knew I didn't want to go up behind them. I had never wanted to go, but now I wasn't sure whether I should. I didn't want to get brained as one of the pursuers they obviously expected. But, on the other hand... The pursuit showed up then, answering it for me. They came up from behind me, stomping rapidly past, about six, I guessed, without even seeing me in their determined chase. More knives and more clubs. I shuddered to think what would have happened if I had been standing in the middle of the path like the hapless fool I was when they had rounded the corner. Would they have stopped to see who I was? Or would they have simply splattered me first as a matter of course? At any rate, they were past and I was safe and... The best thing to do was to leave the way I came. But I followed with only slight hesitation. It was tough keeping up with this bunch. They moved very quickly through the muck, without need for lights or whispered instructions. They seemed to know a lot more about their surroundings than the first group. They lost me. Try as I might, I couldn't keep up with their stealthy, lethal gait. But I did get there in time for the fight. I heard it before I saw it, grunts and groans, boots stomping into mud and faces, the air whirring of metal bludgeons swung wide and hard. I skidded to a halt in the mud at the first sound of anguish and crept around the last bend. It was impossible to tell which side was which, but I counted on the faster movers being the better fighters. From that reckoning, the chasers were beating the living hell out of the chased. The lamps were scattered about, sinking into the mud. From their dim, ghostly glows, I could just see a lonely man through the moving forest of arms and legs up ahead of the struggle. He was crawling along somewhat frantically, dragging the limp form of another. The prisoner from before, obviously. He was trying to reach the entrance of a building which loomed like a cave mouth before him. Belatedly, I realized that this building was my destination as well, for it marked the end of this passageway. Just then, a figure burst loose from the struggle and leaped toward the one doing the dragging. He held a pipe in one muddy fist. The man on the ground released his burden and jumped to his feet to meet the charge. He showed a long, ugly knife. The two sparred for a few moments, dodging and fainting with their respective weapons. Then they closed. There was a spark as they grappled, a sudden twisting urgency. Then the man with the knife slid to the mud between the other's feet. The victor dropped his pipe in favor of the knife and moved over to the figure on the ground. The rest of the fighting was over, the pursuers having finished the job on the pursued. The remaining five rushed over to join the man with the knife huddling over the now liberated prisoner. Great effort was put into trying to inject a little life into the limp form. Someone lifted the head and gave the face a gentle slap. That was when I saw it was a girl. But the fighting wasn't over. The cave mouth was suddenly filled with more men carrying more clubs and pipes and knives. The girl was dropped gently back into the mud and the killing began again. More sparks and more groans. Someone died sinking to his knees and clutching the knife sunk into his chest to the hilt. Someone else died quicker when a pipe connected with an awful, crunching noise. It was very fast, and it was the same as before. Whoever she was, she was important to them. The rescuers fought so well for her that I thought the whole thing was over in a moment. And 
it would have been. But just as they went to pick her up and carry her away for once and for all, a huge fat man loomed into view from the dead in shadows, carrying a blazer in his right fist. The blue arcing beam blinded me as it burst from the shadows. I heard screams and several men trying to run, but by then it was too late. Had been when he had appeared. In seconds, each of the five lay dead, seared through by the latest of man's new clubs. Thank God, Weiss, gushed one of the fallen, surveying what was left of the rescue party about him. Weiss, the fat man with the blazer, and I saw then, the fat man from the trouble on the bridge my first day, ignored the show of gratitude. Others appeared beside him from inside the building. One of them had been the dark skinny one on the bridge. Weiss motioned him towards the girl, motioned the rest toward the casualties. Clean this up, now! He barked in that distinctive snarl. The others hurried to obey. I sighed. Weiss was the name of my contact. Deeper and deeper. In a few moments, the area was almost clear. The dead had been dragged away. The wounded had been helped inside. Only Weiss remained in the doorway, watching the skinny with the girl. Girl, whispered Weiss impatiently to the skinny. Is she awake? Gettle spoke without taking his eyes from her. Well, I thought she was. Weiss surveyed the area warily. Well, never mind now. Just bring her in. Come on he ordered bluntly. With one last glance around, he slipped back into the shadows of the doorway. Gettle pushed a lock of black hair away from his face and bent to lift the girl. She lolled lifelessly in his arms. Then they, too, were gone. I gave them maybe two seconds before I started my splashing, sloshing way across the clearing toward the doorway. I stopped just outside the opening, listening. I knew what was coming, but... That didn't mean I wanted to become a part of it. I heard footsteps just inside the door on a rickety stairway that creaked and rustled rhythmically. I slipped inside and followed the sound. In the dim lamp, in the dim lamp shining down the stairwell, I saw her make her move. He had had her in a fireman's carry to negotiate the narrow passage. She began by driving an elbow into the back of his neck, Collapsed, stunned to his knees, arms up to protect his face. Her feet dribbled against his chest, a flat-handed smack against his forehead. Then she leaped easily over him and trotted down the stairs and froze stock still before me. Her eyes shone wide and spectacular in the lamp. So deep, so green, emeralds floating, glistening, I blocked her first forearm, sidestepped the kick, and brought her shoulder out of position for the killing blow by pulling her roughly and unexpectedly to me. She gasped as her eyes, her incredible eyes, met mine. Was it recognition, astonishment at her effect on me? Was it a reciprocal delight? Maybe? Possibly? I blocked another forearm, slipped a flat hand uppercut, twisted beside her kick, and, and did nothing, nothing at all. I didn't fight back, had no thoughts of doing so. I just didn't want her to hurt me. Or maybe, I thought suddenly, I just don't want her to leave. And, as I hesitated with that thought, she left, slipping past me and out into the black afternoon and mud. She was gone. I closed my eyes. Hers floated clearly still before me. Such eyes. Gettle was coming, too. I wrestled him out of his impossible position on the stairs. Come on, Gettle. We've got to get Weiss, I urged him. Uh, what? Weiss, he mumbled, dazedly. Yeah, Weiss. Come on, I added conspiratorially. We've got to tell him what really happened. He sat up, holding his head. What are you... Hey, the girl! Where's the girl? 
That's it, Gettle. That's it, Gettle. The girl's gone off. We've got to tell Weiss. Hurry up, damn you! I dragged him to his feet and shoved him a couple of steps up the stairs. He stopped, still hesitant. I shoved him again. Damn it, Gettle! You want him to find out from somebody else? That did it. Mumbling, Yeah, yeah, yeah. He staggered ahead, semi-waving for me to follow. I did. And so we passed through much of the labyrinth that made up Weiss's lair. Gettle, weaving and stumbling and not quite running into things up ahead of me, led us down several faintly illuminated corridors and through several manned doorways. For the most part, I ignored the scum standing guard. Occasionally, when one looked too alarmed at my presence, I would wink or shrug or smile and gesture obscenely at Gettle's lack of coordination. That got me up several flights of stairs and through many ugly possibilities. Suddenly, Gettle stopped. He slumped down to the floor before a handful of steps, jury-rigged to make the easier transition from one level to another that was, on second glance, a joint between plasteel bulkheads from two different ships. He held his head with both hands. He rocked forward on his buttocks, grimacing in pain. She, Ice, had really belted him. I stifled a smile and leaned forward to help him up. He glanced up at me in bewilderment. Who are you? He asked, before recognition descended. You! He screeched in an uneven, harsh whisper before I clamped my right hand around his throat. I didn't waste time with threats. I simply lifted him to his feet from there, gripping down on his throat as much as I figured he could take. Once on his feet, I pressed the back of his head against the wall just beneath a lamp. His face looked green and scared. It had every reason to be. Weiss, I hissed meaningfully flexing my fingers. Weiss! He didn't even have to think about it. He gestured with one limp hand, and off we went again. I removed my fingers from his throat, but retained a firm grip on his left shoulder as we moved along. He knew what was what. The only hazard was a guard standing before the most impressive door we had passed so far. It was made out of something that was either wood or could pass for it. It was wide and squat and had a huge door latch. It was obviously the boss's place. The guard eased forward from just off the side and raised a huge right arm in a gesture meant to slow us down for proper admittance procedure. I kicked him in the balls. We both stepped over him. Gettle worked the latch. I slammed him through the opening door and faced Weiss, standing up angrily on the far side of his messy office. You! Crow! He shouted angrily and reached down for what I figured to be the blazer. I ignored him. I found what passed for an easy chair in that dump and plopped down in it across from the desk. Gettle was doubled over on the floor whimpering. I ignored him, too. Weiss came around from behind the desk carrying the blazer. He stopped beside Gettle and glowered at the pair of us. He was mad. What's the idea, Crow? What's the idea, Crow? You still trying to show everybody how tough you are? He looked down at Gettle again and shook his head. I'm getting pretty sick of you, he added menacingly, tightening his grip on the blazer. I lit a cigarette. Does Borklin know you're using his blazer to carve up locals? I asked calmly. The blazer's mine, he retorted furiously. What I do with it is my business. Get that straight. He slammed the pistol from one hand to the other for emphasis and then pointed the butt at me. And get this, too. You keep stomping around here playing big man with my men, and I'm gonna show you just how lucky you were that first time. There was a loud banging on the stairs outside, followed by five lackeys jamming themselves into the room. Ghetto looked up at their approach and smiled sourly at me through bleeding lips. 
He stood up straight and joined them while they took turns staring back and forth between Weiss and me and waiting for the order to sick him. Weiss gestured meaningfully in the direction before continuing. You got it, Crow. We can get done what needs getting done, or it can get tough. What's it gonna be? I had been watching this whole deal from a distance, without feeling or rhythm. It was a long-hated feeling, like being a step behind. It blundered me ahead badly. I'll tell you, Weiss, I began, all thumbs. I don't much care. We can work if you want. I tapped an ash to the floor. But we don't have to, and I'm not sure I like the idea anyway. And then I stood up, abruptly, anger roaring through me from out of nowhere. I slammed the cigarette to the floor, scattering sparks. I'm tired of dealing with scum like this, with cowards and deserters and bullies. Your threats don't mean anything to me. I can still go either way. I pointed a shaking finger. I pounded you once, I can pound you again, and I can crater this bunch at the same time. I wheeled toward them. Who wants to be the first? Gettel answered in a low, sinister tone. Maybe everyone. That's fine, too, I retorted, now shaking all over. Why stared at me like I was crazy? Which, of course, I was. I don't know. That cloudy picture, Weiss, Borglin, me. We were all so bizarre. Especially me. Weiss kept staring for several moments, then relaxed. He sighed, shook his head. Was that compassion I saw in his eyes? Or flat pity? Say the word prompted Gettle, tensing. Shut up and get the hell out. Gettle and company stared at him, unbelieving. But they left. Slowly for Gettle, hoping for a change of heart. It didn't happen. We were alone. Weiss nodded toward the closing door. Him I ought to let you stomp again, he suggested, going back around to his desk. Didn't the first time, I offered, resuming my seat. Some girl was doing that on my way in. That froze him halfway into his chair. What? Is she gone? I nodded. We passed over his whimpers. Why didn't you stop her? What for? I asked, lighting another cigarette. Far as I know, that's her job around here, to teach your punks what tough is. He mumbled something angrily at me under his breath and left. I sat and smoked and listened to him growling orders to his people in the hallway. He came back in after a full minute of that and resumed his seat. He looked disgusted. If you saw the blazer, you saw the fight. You know we wanted her. That's true, Weiss, I agreed. His fat face got very red. Was that it? Was it my always just hating fat men? You rotten son of a bitch! He growled, accusing. What the hell do your little local feuds have to do with me? I've got nothing to do with that. He blinked. His anger disappeared. He looked genuinely surprised. You mean, you really don't know? Huh? I blurted. As stupidly as I felt. No what? But he just shook his head again. Never mind, he said. He sat forward in his chair and reached for a cigar. His voice was businesslike. What about the project's defense screens? Can you get to them? I can do it. When do you need it? Don't know yet, he said, lighting his cigar. We may want to wait a while. How long? Don't know yet, he repeated, eyeing me. Maybe as long as a standard month. Can you handle that? What's your setup over there with those people? Just let me know. Weiss puffed a couple of irritated puffs. 
All right, Crow. Go ahead and play independent, but you may need me later on. Not likely. I replied coldly. Okay, damn it! He retorted, stung. Just tell me this much. What do they know about me? You, I echoed, surprised. Nothing. Well, then, what do you plan to tell them when they find out you've been coming here? Or did you really think there were secrets in a place this small? I felt my cheeks heating up with embarrassment. I hadn't even considered the problem. Even worse, Weiss could see that I hadn't. But he let it slide. Tell them we met on Elia, he pushed on, during your piracy trial. I sat up. What do you know about that? I know about it. Saw most of it. Cost me a half term's worth of credits for court tickets. He smiled then. But I was there at the end. Now what the hell was this? Admiration? Damn the bastard! Well, sorry to disappoint you by getting off, I said sourly, which was damned idiotic for me to say. But why the hell not? I was being an idiot, wasn't I? I stood up to leave before I got any worse. Between Weiss's insulting me and admiring me and my own dazed, thumb-fingered lack of touch, I knew it couldn't get anything else but... I stopped at the door and looked back. Weiss was eyeing me without emotion through the cigar smoke. I had a sudden adolescent desire to shatter that. Tell me, Weiss. How did you and Borgling get together? Is there a regular meeting place for deserters? Weiss frowned. He looked disappointed, as if I had let him down. We met on Banshee, he answered evenly, a year ago. A year ago? Weiss, you're full of bull. Banshee was destroyed two years ago. He stared, and then instead of looking insulted, he looked amused. A smile began to form at the corners of his mouth. Destroyed? Is that what they're saying? The smile became a chuckle, and then a laugh. <laughs> Destroyed, huh? Well, all the ants, anyway, I added lamely. That only made him laugh all the harder. A bitter, knowing laugh. What's so goddamn funny, Weiss? I demanded desperately. He looked at me and stopped laughing. But the smile, now bitter throughout, remained. Never mind, Jack, he said in a patronizing tone. You wouldn't understand. I jerked the door open angrily, stopped, barked acidly back. Or care. He only nodded. Or care. He agreed reasonably. I went hurriedly out, slamming the door behind me. I made too much noise stomping away to be able to hear if he was laughing behind me. So bizarre.